we are going to take a little detour this morning. <clears throat> I had a question come in this last week, and I thought, well, I'm going to give about a five-minute answer to that, and I'm just going to, you know, kind of capsule it and, and move on. And the longer the week went on, the more it wasn't sitting right with me. And last night it wasn't sitting well at all. So I thought, well, let's, let's get ready to make the switch. And this morning it feels right to make the switch. So I think we need to, this kind of comes out of last Sunday, but we need to address this. Was it last Sunday I spoke about or was it the Sunday before? No, it might have been last Sunday. Anyway, here's the question. Um, I have an honest question about the prophets. If we are just to listen to the Holy Spirit and depend on him for the truth, why are there prophets? Would you be able to tell us how we are to test the prophets this Sunday at church? I honestly am trying to understand this. So there's a couple of questions there. Why are there prophets and how do you test the prophets? The last one is really easy. Either they're right or they're wrong. <laughs> um, it's, 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 you know, the way you test them is you just look at their track record. And anybody can miss it. I don't think there's anybody that's 100%. But uh, the lower that percentage drops, the more you just kind of go, well, they're still working on it, and let them work on it. Give them some grace. But <clears throat> the other question is, uh, why are there prophets? And it was stated this way, if we're just to listen to the Holy Spirit and depend on him for the truth, why are there prophets? Well, I want to touch something, that, that one phrase, if we're just to listen to the Holy Spirit, we are not supposed to just listen to the Holy Spirit. But he is the primary one we listen to. He's the first one, the, the dominant one we listen to. But there are prophets, there are gifts of the Spirit where you've got words of knowledge, words of wisdom, uh, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. These are all ways that God does speak. However, the, the predominant way is the Holy Spirit was put into us to speak to us. In fact, John said it this way in 1 John chapter 2, uh, it's verse 20 and 27. He said, the anointing you have received, which we know according to Luke 4, that anointing comes from the Holy Spirit, because Jesus said the Holy Spirit is upon me. He has anointed me to do the things that Jesus did. So we know the Holy Spirit is the one who anoints us. John said in 1 John 2, <clears throat> he said, the anointing you have will teach you. Amen. In fact, he goes on and he says, you don't have to have others to teach you because the anointing will teach you. Now, he's not contradicting like you've got the, the, the five major gifts, apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists. He's not contradicting the, the need for teaching but he is trying to make the same point. It's the Holy Spirit, it's the anointing that we should go to for our first source of information, for our first source of teaching, and not to, to someone else. So he's not, <clears throat> you don't just listen to the Holy Spirit and skip all the other gifts, but if it's being done right, hopefully the Holy Spirit is speaking through those other gifts and you're hearing him anyway. So there is kind of that. But the, the second part of that question is, why are there prophets? Because we need them. You know, that's, that's the short version of it. But I understand the question is deeper than that. <laughs> um, if the Holy Spirit is the one leading us and guiding us and teaching us, why are there prophets? So the, the definition for the word prophet means to speak forth for God or to foretell the future by God or for God. You know, so it's, it's getting information into this, this system that God wants spoken through a person. That's a prophet. Of course, if you're working under the gifts of the Holy Spirit and you give a word of knowledge, it's basically the same thing. You're just not working in the office of a prophet. But you're also speaking forth for God. And you're getting information that God wants said to a person, an individual. Um, so that it, it's... It's getting information into this realm. You say, why do we need that? Because we don't always hear the Holy Spirit clearly. And God has other avenues or methods to get information to us. 
our predominant information should come through the Holy Spirit. But the word prophet means someone who speaks forth for God or foretells the future with God's help or for God he's foretelling the future. Now, this is usually the confusion point. There is a huge difference between the way they operated in the Old Testament and the way they operate in the New Testament, even though they do the same thing. There's a huge difference in, in importance there. And this might be something that maybe not everybody knows. But when it comes to the cross or Jesus' death and resurrection and the new covenant began, you've got the Old Testament, you've got the New Testament. New Testament began at the death and resurrection of Jesus. There are things from the Old Testament that come through the, new te through the cross into the New Testament totally unchanged. Nothing changed. There are things from the Old Testament that come to the cross and are changed. They come through, but they're changed. And then there's things in the Old Testament that come to the cross and stop. They don't come through at all. It just was done at the cross, and nothing moves forward. An example of coming to the cross or coming to a Jesus' death and resurrection and stopping is the Old Testament sacrifices. They came to the cross. They're done now. The, the supreme sacrifice has been made. So we no longer need to make any kind of sacrifices, anything like that. Coming to the cross and things stop, there's a lot, uh, things change. Let's go with change first. Coming to the cross and they change because of what Jesus did. There's a lot of them. Um, a prime example of one is the blood. In the Old Testament, the blood of animals or the sacrifices covered sins so that in other words, it, it was like taking and covering it up so you couldn't see it. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, our sins are not covered. Our sins are washed away. Amen. They're gone. They weren't gone up until the cross. They were just kind of like hidden. They were covered under the blood until Jesus would come and say, okay, let's deal with that thoroughly and get rid of them. So the, the application of the blood to sin totally changed at the cross. Things that came through the cross unchanged. Oh, there's, again, lots of them. Um, God is the creator of heaven and earth in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That didn't change at the cross. Um, there's a trinity. That didn't change at the cross. The fear of the Lord. We're supposed to fear the Lord in the Old Testament. Guess what? We're supposed to fear the Lord in the New Testament. That didn't change coming through the cross. Praise and worship. Praise and worship was huge in the Old Testament. Praise and worship is huge in the New Testament. That didn't change. Now, sometimes how you apply it and the application of it changed a little bit, but the actual concept of praise and worship didn't change. So some things came through the cross unchanged. Some things changed at the cross, and other things stopped. The office of the prophet came through the cross, but it changed a bit. And that is what I think causes the problems because for whatever reason, it's hard, maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's us, the, the ministers, the, the church, who are not dealing with this correctly that's causing the problem. But we are not living in the Old Testament anymore. We are under a new covenant. That changed at the cross. We still have a covenant, but it's a new covenant. So the things from the old covenant are all, they talk about God and they explain God and they, a lot of them point to Jesus and what would come. And there's a lot of pictures in the Old Testament that point forward to Jesus because he was the fulfillment of what they were headed for. But the way they did things, we don't do them anymore. Not that way. You have to make that separation when you're reading the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't operate the way they did back there. Or there'd be a lot of dead prophets right now. <laughs> We'd have taken them out and stoned them because that's how they operated. And those of us who have, have gotten in certain forms of sin, you'd be stoned too. You'd be dead too. You know, we just, we just don't operate the way it operated back there. We operate differently now. This is the covenant of grace. That was the covenant of law. But when they're both mingled, 
and people read the Old Testament, pull out a scripture and try to apply it to today, you can really hit the ditch in a hurry because the way it operated back there doesn't always apply to today. In fact, most of it doesn't apply to today. So <clears throat> that's why I get leery about, and, and I, I don't offend or hurt anybody's feelings or whatever, but I get leery about people who, whenever they're hearing from God, they're pulling Scripture out of the Old Testament to hear from God. And the God of the Old Testament and law interacted with the human race totally different than the God of grace and the New Testament and how he interacts with the human race. Same God. And they'll say, well, he's the same God yesterday and today and forever. I know he is. But when my children were three, four, five years old versus their adults, and they have their own three, four, five-year-olds, the same dad handles them totally different. He, at least he better. You say, well, give me an example. Well, when they were three, four, five years old, if they acted out, I spanked them. I don't think I should do that when they're 35. I mean, that, that could go bad. So, you, you know, because they'll always use the argument, well, God's the same. So, yeah, I know God's the same. I'm not an idiot. I, I get that part. But God doesn't relate with us the same way in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And when you try to make that the same, you run into all kinds of trouble, especially with the prophets, especially. You say, Why? Because in the Old Testament, the prophet was the primary source for hearing God's voice and seeing the supernatural operate. Primary source. Because everybody else, nobody had the Holy Spirit. Everybody else was basically unsaved. Their sins were covered, but there was nobody saved. Salvation didn't come until the death and resurrection of Jesus. So let me give you an example. Go with me to 1 Kings I mean, the, the Old Testament is full of it, but 1 Kings 11 is, is a good example that kind of just, it jumped out to me, so I thought, well, let's use this one. You've got after Saul, you've got the division, or after Solomon, my mistake, you've got the division of the tribes of Israel under two separate kings, Jeroboam, who was the anointed king of God, and Rehoboam, who was Solomon's son, who should have taken over by he was the heir, Okay. Uh, Rehoboam was a bad king and ended up with one tribe, the tribe of Judah, that followed him, where Jeroboam, the one who was anointed by God to take over, was a good king and had the other 11 tribes follow him. So we're going to jump in at uh, jump in at verse 26, 1 Kings 11. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials. So He's seeing this thing's going awry, and he's stepping up to say no. Verse 27, here is the account of how he rebelled against the king, and it explains how it all went. So he was in the process of rebelling and standing up and pushing back because it wasn't right. Verse 29, about that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way. The prophet was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in the country, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, now he's going to begin to prophesy to him, and he's going to prophesy the future. Take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give it to give you 10 tribes. And that's ultimately what he ended up with. He started with 11, ended up with 10. Verse 32, but for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. And that's how it started. Verse 33, I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites. So they were worshiping false gods. And they have not walked in my ways, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my statutes, the laws of David, as, fa as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hands. And he goes on and lays out exactly how this thing's going to play out. And 
eventually says, Jeroboam, you're the one who's going to be the king. I know you're not Solomon's son, but you're the one who's going to be the king. That was the work of a prophet in those days. That was typical. They would say, here's what God wants done, so here's what's going to happen now. Here's what we're going to do. And he would lay it out. Now, you had correct prophets and you had false prophets. They didn't want the false prophets. That's why they were up to being stoned. If they didn't hit it, run or die, one or the other. Because the only way they heard God was through a prophet. The priests heard God through the breastplate with the Urim and the Thummim, but that seems to be more... It, it wasn't as predominant as the prophets. The prophets were the predominant voice for God. So when the prophets spoke, the main thing they had to figure out was this God or was this not God. And if they didn't like a certain prophet, like certain kings, Ahab didn't like Elijah, Jezebel liked him less, and wanted him dead, because not because he was a false prophet, because they were into stuff they shouldn't have been into, and he kept confronting them on it and causing problems for them. So they wanted to kill him. Now, he's in a good example of the prophets not only spoke for God, but they, if the supernatural was going to show up, it usually showed up through a prophet. Uh, Elijah, he's the one who called fire down on the sacrifice. And he's the, I think it was Elisha who made the axe head float in the water when the guy lost it. It's it just supernatural stuff usually happened through a prophet. In the New Testament, supernatural stuff is available to all of us. All you have to do is be a believer. It's no longer limited to a person. It is available to everybody. And as a result, see, in the Old Testament, if we were living under that time, if you didn't know a prophet or have access to one, you never heard from God, and you probably had very little, if any, supernatural take place in your life. It all came through the prophet. Now you don't need a prophet. And you can hear from God, and you can have supernatural flowing through your life. Because that was a huge change that took place at the cross. The Spirit didn't just come on one man. Now the Holy Spirit is on and in every person who wants him. And we have the access. These are the signs that follow them that believe, and Jesus listed them. So we can all, if we're believers, we can all operate in this. In the Old Testament, it was prophet only. New Testament, it's everybody. You can't mix those two, because if you do, you get in trouble. So you say, so if we can all operate it in, in it, then what is the purpose of the prophet in the New Testament? Which is a very legitimate question. Well, <clears throat> let's go there. Let's talk about prophet a little bit. Now, I'm going to hit these scriptures a little later, and we'll actually read them. But the primary source to hear God is the Holy Spirit. John 14 talks about it. John 16 talks about it. I already quoted to you 1 John 2. Um, so that's the primary. But prophets still do what they did in the Old Testament. You say, what did prophets do in the Old Testament? They spoke forth for God. He wanted a message out there. They'd speak it. They would foretell the future. They still do that today. Something added, which I presume they did it back then. Uh, Elijah did it with the widow and her son who were running out of food and so forth. 1 Corinthians 14, the prophet or prophecies are to bring comfort, encouragement, and edification, which he did that with the widow back there, so that's not necessarily new. And in the Old Testament, they would call things into being. They, they would, like for instance, when the axe fell in the water and the guy's freaking out because it was a borrowed axe and he couldn't afford to buy a new one and he just lost his friend's axe, what is he going to do? Well, he caused some supernatural thing to take place. He called it into being, and the axe floated, and the guy grabbed the axe head, and he was good to go. Uh, and that still happens today. They call things into being. In fact, we all call things into being. Right. Romans chapter 4, this is how God operates, and this was the principle given to Abraham. The God who calls things that are not as though they were. That covers every believer. 
That doesn't just cover prophets. That co- if you're going to walk in faith, you're going to call things that are not as though they were. You're going to call yourself healed according to the Word of God when you're still struggling with the problem. You know, it's just as an example. You're going to call yourself uh, uh, financially solvent when it looks like you're going down, if you're going to come out of that, you're going to grab some rhema scriptures that the Holy Spirit gives you out of the Word, and you're going to begin calling those into being in your life to keep you from totally crashing financially and helping to pull that thing around and get you back up and running again. It's if we don't operate as believers in calling the things that are not, you say, but it's not that way. I know it's not that way. That's why we have to call it according to the word and what it says it's supposed to be. And we call it into being and make it happen. So the, again, the actual working of how the prophet work came through the cross pretty much unchanged. There is a big difference, though. We don't follow them as our primary source. We follow the Holy Spirit as our primary source. And a prophet will come along and will help with that if they're a true prophet and and help us down that road a little further. But we follow the Holy Spirit as our primary source. So let's look at a number of, this is the best way to see it. We'll just look at a number of scriptures that have to do with, with prophecy in the New Testament. Now, let me remind you, let's go to Matthew 26, verse number 31. We'll go verse 31 through 34. If you bring that up on the screen, I'll just read it off the screen. Now remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, even though in your Bible it says, before Genesis, it says the Old Covenant or the First Covenant, depending upon which translation you read, when you get to the last page of Malachi, the first page of Matthew, there'll be a page there that will say the New Covenant or the New Testament. That's not actually technically correct because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were still under the Old Testament. It changed at the end of the book when Jesus died and rose from the dead. So when you're reading about things happening in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was fulfilling the Old Testament. It hadn't actually flipped until he dies and rose from the dead. So when Jesus prophesied, he was prophesying as an Old Testament prophet. Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. He's talking to the disciples, and he's about to get arrested and be crucified. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he's prophesying to them off of an Old Testament scripture. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. That was not written in the Old Testament. That's a pure prophecy of what's coming. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Depending upon what translation you read, they put the number three in front of the rooster crowing too. For the rooster crows three times, you'll disown me three times. Just different personality in how they wrote it. That is pure prophecy. Jesus is foretelling the future. This is what's coming. This is how it will happen to basically an unsaved man. Because Peter was unsaved at that point. Jesus hadn't died and rose from the dead. Peter did not have the Holy Spirit inside of him. He could not hear God's voice for himself, at least not very clearly. We know he could hear the devil's voice because he got rebuked on that one. (laughs) But he couldn't hear God's voice very clearly. So in that setting, which is still actually Old Testament setting, Jesus prophesied like the Old Testament prophets prophesied and said, this is what's going to be, this is how it's going to play out, boom. So now let's go to after the cross. Let's go to the book of Acts. We'll start at chapter 11. After the book of, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, after the cross, we'll start Acts 11, uh, we'll jump in at verse 27. During this time, there was a time going on. We could go back and read the context of it, but it's beside the point. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. 
the disciples, each according to their ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in, Ju in Judea because there was famine going on and they were struggling to find food, probably. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So there's an example of a New Testament prophet doing basically what an Old Testament prophet did. He foretold the future. This is what's coming. So it does happen. So anybody who says, now we know that Thessalonians says don't despise prophecies, but judge them. Um, anybody who says, well, prophets, say blah, 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 blah. No, this stuff still is supposed to happen. People are still supposed to foretell the future. It's just they're not our first source of information. So let's go to another one. Acts chapter 13, we'll start at verse number 1. And I'm reading NIV on, on most of these as far as I know. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and they name them Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. You say, why do they name them that way? Because to my knowledge, they hadn't come into surnames yet. A surname is your last name. It, Vern Peltz is my surname. In those days, you probably had 20 Verns living in the community, so you added a description to them. Vern, who came from the farm in North Dakota, if nobody else came from that place. Or Vern, the son of Irvin. Well, if they didn't know who Irvin was, that didn't help either. You know, so they would put in descriptive terms, and then eventually somebody came up with the idea of, why don't we come up with another name? and your whole family go by that name. That way we know who you belong to. So they came up with surnames, last names. And most of the time they were named either after, most of the time it was their trade or what they did. But it could also be an activity they were involved in or region they lived in. Some cases it was their appearance. Certain families carry distinct appearances. And when they said, time to choose a last name, somebody gave them a suggestion and said, choose this one. Like, for instance, if I had this last name, I would have struggled with this. But in North Dakota, there was a whole group of Germans that their last name was Broadhead. <laughs> you say, where would they come up with that name? Think about it. <laughs> Put two and two together. You'll probably make that work. So my last name is Peltz. Okay? Where'd they come up with that? Well, my children wanted... <laughs> it's funny. My children, everybody's got a family crescent that goes way back to when they started the last names and the surnames. So far. I don't know why we're on this, but... Anyway, everybody's got... You can track your family tree and go back to your family crescent. And my two boys are kind of the warrior image. You know, they, they want something strong like William Wallace or something like that in the family crescent. Okay? So they researched pelts back. Once you could get online and the internet was there, you could find anything. So they researched pelts back. <laughs> and I'll never forget. Jess was so disgusted. He said, you know what's on our family crescent? A sheep. <laughs> A sheep and a bunch of little animals. And it's like, well, yeah. We operated in P-E-L-T-S, pelts. Skins of animals. We were probably tanners or, or something like that in, our, in that time period when they picked the last name. And somebody already had probably picked the name Tanner for the last name. You've heard of that. You know, George Tanner. Well, they were probably doing the tanning too. So since they picked that name and our family's got to have a different name, pelts, we work with skins, pelts. They were disgusted. They wanted something powerful. Sheep, I'll never forget that. We have a sheep on, <laughs> on our family crescent. Anyway, back to Acts 13. No, that was, that was all free. Not, not part of the plan. So they named these prophets and these teachers, verse number two, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Now I am, it doesn't say it, at least not in this translation, I didn't look in the other translations, but I am presuming the reason they named the prophets and teachers is because they were the ones the Holy Spirit spoke through to separate Barnabas and Saul. That, that's the only thing that makes any sense here. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, well, who did he say it to? Well, they just named the people. Why would you name these people and call them prophets and teachers right in front of this statement? Because these people played a role in what the Holy Spirit said, and there was a handful of, of people who the Holy Spirit said, this is what needs to be done, and they named them off and said, here's the God is speaking. He's speaking through these people, and they want Barnabas and Saul to join up and go to which I have called them. They didn't receive their call into ministry through that. They just received a joining. So that's interesting. Prophets do that. Obviously, teachers were part of that in this situation also. In chapter 15, verse number 32 of Acts, we have another example, uh, Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets. Here we have an example of 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. That is part of prophecy. It's supposed to encourage us. It's supposed to strengthen us, even if it calls us out sometimes. And sometimes prophets will kind of call you out and say, you know, what you're up to. Nah, 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 nah. That is an encouragement to repent and get going the right direction. It's not a judgment. It's not a condemnation. It's a... Uh, yeah, you got cookie crumbs in your face, and I see you got your hand in the jar. You probably want to change that behavior. That's an encouragement. So that's what it's supposed to be. Encourage you to start listening to the Holy Spirit for yourself because you already know you're wrong. You're just not obeying. Um, <clears throat> Acts 21, let's go there. Now, this is, this is going to be an interesting chapter 20 and 21. We're going to kind of work through this, but let's start with chapter 21, verse 7. This is interesting here. Paul is speaking here. He's on a, on a voyage. He's heading back for Jerusalem before he gets arrested and ultimately thrown in prison and ends up in Rome. He says, we continued on our voyage from Tyre and landed at whatever the name of that town is, I don't know, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. So there was Christians there, and they, Paul knew them, so he probably started that group. Verse 8, leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven. So there were seven evangelists living there. He, Philip, had four unmarried daughters who prophesied, which is just a random piece of information because it doesn't seem to fit in with the rest. But Paul gives it for whatever reason. Verse 10, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So Agabus is predicting the future. And he's predicting Paul is going to be bound, which he was. He's, he was chained and put in prison, and this is how it goes. And he says, the Holy Spirit saying, this is, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem, he even names who's going to do it, are going to bind you and hand you over to the Gentiles. Now, notice something here. When we heard this, we and the people were there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. They were missing God. The prophet spoke accurately out of their probably love for Paul, their own emotions, whatever. They interpreted the prophecy to say, see, Paul, you shouldn't go. The Holy Spirit's telling you not to go. Holy Spirit never said any such thing. We can do that a lot if we're not really careful with what God says. Because God will tell us something, and then we apply it in a way that 
some, like in this case, was opposite of God. He was supposed to go to Jerusalem. That was part of his destiny. He was supposed to end up in Rome before Caesar. That was part of his destiny. But it doesn't seem right. See, you can almost see how the emotion got involved. And they're going to do bad things to Paul. Paul, don't go. The Holy Spirit warned you. Why would he warn you if you shouldn't stay here? See how reasoning gets in, human thinking gets in, and the words of the Holy Spirit actually did say get falsely applied. Be very careful of that because we do it all the time. If we're not really careful, that's why we say write it down, record it, go back and listen to it over and over exactly what it said, and don't go, well, you would think it means this, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Do not do that. You will miss God. What makes sense is what he said. Don't apply it. Let him apply it. You just watch for what he said. Verse 13, here's Paul's answer to that. They pleading with him in verse 12. Don't go to Jerusalem. Paul said, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, they couldn't talk him out of it. We gave up. So, okay, fine. You're going to be stubborn and just go, go ahead and do it. We finally gave up and said, all right, fine. The Lord's will be done. Why was Paul so solid on this? Well, to get that, you got to go back a chapter. Go back to chapter 20. We're going to jump in at verse 17 and get the context of this. Chapter 20, verse 17. So this is previous to what just happened. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. So he was, again, working his way back towards Jerusalem. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you? From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So he's rehearsing what he had taught this church. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Oh, that's why when they f interpreted Agabus's prophecy wrongly, Paul didn't go with it. Because the Holy Spirit had already spoken to him. Amen. He already knew. So I don't care what you say this prophet's saying, I'm doing what the Holy Spirit told me to do. Holy Spirit's input is primary. Um, we'll jump back in. in na, 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 na. We're in verse number 22. And now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. Oh, so he didn't know what was ha going to happen. So what was Agabus' prophecy for? To talk him out of it? To change his direction? No. What did Agabus prophesy? He took his belt, tied himself up, and said, this is what is going to happen to you. The Jews are going to turn you over to the Gentiles. Tie that in with this verse right here. Paul says, I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem. I just don't know what's going to happen there. God gave him a piece of information to help him understand, okay, Paul, be ready, because this isn't going to turn out pretty. It wasn't to tell him what to do. It was to encourage him, when it goes bad, it's okay. Now, the people heard that and went, oh, no, don't go. God's telling you not to go. And he's saying, no, the Holy Spirit already told me to go. I'm going. He knew all that's happening is through Agabus, the prophet, God was being kind enough to him to say, Paul, be ready, because this is what's coming. Because he didn't know what was coming. Verse 23, I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. So that wasn't the first prophecy or word that he got through people. Others were telling him something is going to happen. Agabus expounded on that. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, 
the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Okay, so that's chapter 20, verse 24. Now we're going to just continue on. Let me see if I can get there in my Bible. Acts 20, verse 24 is what we just read. Now it, it talks about verse 25, I know that none of among you whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. And he's kind of giving his, his farewell message to him. Verse 28, keep watch over the flock which, uh, of, of which the Holy Spirit's made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church because, verse 29, after I'm gone, wolves are going to try to come in and destroy what's happening here, destroy the church, verse 31, so be on guard. And he, he talks about how he ministered to them and so forth. Once he got done talking, verse 32, now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance. And he, he encourages them, verse 36, when he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. Why? Because they knew they wouldn't see him again, verse 38. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. He knew. The Holy Spirit had spoken to him. He knew. This is the last time through, and it's going to change now. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Verse 1 of chapter 21, Acts. The story just continues. After we had torn ourselves away from them, because this was a very emotional thing, they wept, they embraced each other. Verse 37, this was, this was a huge send-off. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. So he's just describing here is how we're working our way back to Jerusalem. We're catching these different ships and we're on the way. Verse 3, after sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre where our ship was to unload its cargo. So it's going to be, the ship's going to set there for a while because it's got to be unloaded. Verse 4, finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. So it took seven days to unload that ship, presuming he caught the same ship or he just laid over for a few days. But he stayed there for a week. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. Really? By now, you should have some background on this to go, wait a second. The Holy Spirit told Paul he needs to go. We haven't gotten to Agabus' prophecy yet. That's in this chapter. But now the Holy Spirit is telling him not to go. No, he's not. I'm so glad they threw this in. These people were missing God. They thought the Holy Spirit was telling them to urge Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And they said it that way. The Spirit of God, Tim, is telling me, don't do it. Don't do it. So just because a Christian speaks into your life doesn't mean it's accurate. Doesn't mean it's God. Well, what am I supposed to do? You got to hear God for yourself. See, this just emphasizes that point. Paul had heard God. He was totally, I know this is where I'm supposed to go. I keep being warned this is going to be rough, but this is where I'm supposed to go. They couldn't talk him out of it. So now we get a word from the Lord that says, Paul, you can't go. And it wasn't just one, the way it says it. Through the Spirit, they, who is they? Finding disciples. There was more than one. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. The whole works was missing it. They thought it was the Holy Spirit speaking to them and telling them, tell Paul not to go. The whole works was missing it. Thank God Paul knew enough to follow the Holy Spirit for himself. That is a huge lesson we need to learn. Just because someone says, well, the Lord told me to tell you this. If it doesn't agree with what the Lord already told you, throw it out. I don't care if they say it's the Holy Spirit. I don't care if Jesus came in a vision. I don't care. 
Whatever the Holy Spirit told you, ye, that is primary. Everything else gets weighed secondary. Here's the problem with the charismatic, prophetic, New Testament, full gospel church. We all want to hear a word from God because we can't hear him clearly enough ourselves. And that's why there's so many people in the church running in circles confused. Because, oh, I think the Holy Spirit's telling you this. Oh, I think the Holy Spirit's telling you this. I went to so-and-so's meeting and they prophesied. About I don't give a rip. What did God tell you? That's what you do. It don't make any difference who the big name speaker was that prophesied over you. Everybody can miss it. Just like they did. Everybody can miss it. Then if you go on down here, that's where you, you find they, they left there and went to a different town. They're on the way. And that's where you come to Agabus, and Agabus gave the prophecy. That's the one we read first and uh, walked them through that. Paul already knew his purpose. You say, how did he know? Well, let me give you two scriptures. Acts chapter 9, we'll start at verse 15. Remember when Paul got knocked off his horse? And he ended up blind because the glory of the Lord was so bright it burned out his physical eyes and he needed healing. And God sent somebody to Paul. This person worked as a prophet. Doesn't state him to be a prophet, but he was, you say, what's a prophet? A prophet is one who speaks for God. God told Ananias, verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man, speaking of Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how big a house, how many airplanes, how many beautiful cars he will be given for my name. Oh, that's right. That's the American gospel. There's the real one. He's going to do awesome stuff, and life is going to really suck for him. Because he's in my will. Be very careful you don't judge people for life's going rough for them. Oh, they've got to be doing something wrong because we live in God's blessing. Careful, careful, careful. That's the American gospel. That's not the real one. The real one is, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name because he's going to do so much important stuff. Okay? And I, Ananias is sweating bricks because he was complaining a little bit to God here. This is the guy who's killing Christians, you know. And that was previous to verse 15. And Jesus said, I'm telling you to do something. You go do it. So verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. That was his name at that point. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, how did Ananias know that? I presume it's because Jesus told him. I don't know that word had necessarily spread yet. So I'm presuming he heard that when Jesus was talking to him. He has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, did he notice he was blind when he walked in? I don't know. Uh, I presume again that if you, if you read and, and put yourself in Ananias' spot, Jesus probably told him, you're going to have to deal with some of these things. He needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he laid his hands on him immediately. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Now, it doesn't say there that Ananias ever told Saul what Jesus told him to tell him. But I presume he did. I mean... Why wouldn't he? <laughs> uh, so God told, or G Jesus told Ananias, place your hands on Saul and talk to him, and I will show him this man is my chosen instrument. Carry my name before the Gentiles and kings. I will show him how much he must suffer. I presume he shared that with him, but maybe he didn't because it doesn't flat out say. You say, well, how did Paul know then what he was supposed to do. Ah, go to Acts 26. When he is now on the way to Rome and he's stopping off at these different kings and, and being held in prison, he shares his story with King Agrippa. And verse 13, we're jumping into the middle of it. He's sharing his story with the king. Acts 26, about noon, O king, I was on the road. 
I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who in the world is speaking to me? Who are you, master? That's what the word Lord means, master, owner, keeper. So he was smart enough to know if this thing got bright, knocked me off my horse, I'm laying here, I can't see anything, let's show some respect. He didn't know he was talking to Jesus yet. He said, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Can you imagine how the breath went out of him when he said that? Because that was the one, <laughs> he was trying to kill all his followers. And all of a sudden it's like, oh no. Verse 16, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people, which is an interesting concept. I will rescue you from the Jews, the Israelites, and from the Gentiles or the unsaved. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the... Vision from heaven. Oh. So Ananias might have told him. Ananias might not have told him. Who do visions come from? Who, not the place, not where. Who do visions come through? Oh, come now. Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, the whole in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. There will be dreams, there will be visions, there will be prophecies. Visions come from the Holy Spirit. The place they originate is heaven, but they come through the Holy Spirit. From the beginning, Paul knew the end. That's why when people are prophesying over them and giving them words that were wrong, there was no way you were going to change his mind because he had already heard from the Spirit of God. He had seen it in a vision. So when it comes to listening to words of knowledge, being in prayer lines, being spoken over, someone calling you and saying, the Lord told me to share this with you, and on and on and on and on and on, that whole thing. It all comes second to what the Lord told you. And if he didn't tell you anything about it yet, you just take it, you put it on the shelf, and I find a way to make a note of it. I'll write it down, I'll do something so I don't forget. Because it might be three, five years later, all of a sudden it begins happening, and it's like, oh yeah, that's right, so-and-so said, no, I wonder, can't remember what they said. So make a note of it, put it on the shelf, that's the end of it. I won't pay any attention to it. Unless God has already spoken to me about it, it's of no interest to me. I'll hang on to it, because if the Holy Spirit starts speaking to me about it, now I'll grab it, now I'm interested in it. But until then, no interest to me. Why? Because I have no desire to be deceived. <laughs> and I'm not saying the people who are speaking to me are bad people. All I'm saying is, we had a, some really good examples in Scripture of people with good intent miss God. Had Paul listened to him, he would have missed his, a big chunk of his destiny. Didn't listen to him. He wasn't interested in what they had to say. Well, he should have been. No, he shouldn't have been, because he already knew. The Holy Spirit had already spoken to him. Hang on a second. Works better if I mute that before I do that. <clears throat> um, so when it comes to the myriad of prophecies we've had and some of them not all of them but some of them that seem to be wrong and what do we do with prophets now we do the same thing now as we did before god will use prophets it's one of the languages he specifically states in acts 2 as being part of the last days old men will dream dreams young men will prophesy on your sons and daughters i will pour out my spirit and they will prophesy it's said twice 
It is absolutely a language of the last days. But it's not in the same caliber as how prophets operated in the Old Testament. Get out of that. Get over in the New Testament. The prophet will encourage you. The prophet will comfort you. He will give you some thoughts of what may be coming in the future. He will speak some things into being in agreement with the Holy Spirit. But the whole thing, 1 Corinthians 14 and and Thessalonians says, the whole thing they say, you need to judge. And hang on to what's correct. Hang on to what's right. Well, how do I know what's right? What did God already tell you? What agrees with that, hold on to. What doesn't agree with that, just let it go. They're growing. They're learning. You say, well, they're a nationwide minister. They're growing. They're learning. I don't care who they are and what their name is. makes no difference. They can miss God. They're growing and they're learning. and Well, they miss God because it doesn't agree with what the Holy Spirit already told me. So I'm going to end this by giving you some scriptures on this, and, and we will talk about this more in the future, but it falls, falls in with that question. Hearing God's voice for ourselves. Let me just give you some scriptures. John chapter 10. Jesus is speaking here now. He's talking about himself and the sheep and the sheep pen. Verse 4. When he had brought out all his own, he's explaining how the the shepherd works, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Is Jesus your shepherd or not? If Jesus is your shepherd, you know his voice. If you don't, you need to memorize that scripture and start calling those things that are not as though they were until that happens. Verse 5 but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. There is a level deeper, and I don't want to take a bunch of time on it, but I want to point it out. Not only do you know Jesus' voice, you know how it sounds. You know how he speaks. You know his inflection. You know how he talks with you, and he will talk whether it's through the Holy Spirit or him personally, it makes no difference, they're one. He will talk differently to all of us, and he'll give his own kind of stamp of, this is how I talk to you. And surprise, surprise, most of the time he doesn't talk in King James. <laughs> you ever heard those prophecies when all we had was a King James translation, and everybody thought Jesus talked King James, or the Holy Spirit's talking? Behold, Thou knowest. And they go off prophesying in King James. They never talk King James till they prophesy. God does not talk in King James. (laughs) I'm just saying, that that was a religious, traditional thing. It's not God. He will talk to us with certain phrases, with certain ways that you are never, this is what the Holy Spirit told me, don't ever utter those out loud of how this is God, how God talks to me. Don't ever tell anybody. Or now you let the cat out of the bag. Because we have guardian angels, we also have familiar demons, familiar spirits as they're called. And they're wondering how he can get messages to us that they can't mess up and we know his voice. We're not going to follow their voice even though they try to speak into our life. We recognize, yeah, that's not God. This is God because this is how he speaks to me. They want to know what are the key phrases, what are the key terms he uses with you. Don't tell them. Boy, and that's worth your whole morning. That right there is worth your whole morning. If you don't have that yet, you need to start calling those things as are not as though they were and saying, God, show me, talk to me. Because there's two, three, four key phrases that when I'm really struggling, the, the Holy Spirit or Jesus will talk to me a certain way. And I go, boom, that's God. I recognize his voice. Never share those phrases. You say, why? Because you have an enemy standing right there listening, and that enemy, once they know, oh, that's what he says, guess what they're going to do? Start imitating and copying, and now you're confused. So you just don't, you recognize his voice, and you recognize a stranger's voice. When someone calls you on the phone, how do you know who it is? If it's someone who you're pretty well acquainted with. 
you recognize their voice. If I'd call you and say, hey, good morning, this is Dean calling, you'd go, Dean who? You don't sound like Dean. No, really, this is Dean calling. I just want to, Pastor Vern, is this you? How did you know? You recognize my voice. I didn't have to announce myself. In fact, I tried to deceive you and say, this is Dean calling. No, you recognize my voice. We should recognize Jesus' voice. And we should also, in that, recognizing his voice, there are certain ways certain people talk to you, and they're all different. They use certain phrases. They emphasize certain vowels a different way. It's, it's, it's their voice. It's how they talk to you. And someone else can come along and try to copy them, and you'll, you'll recognize, like, eh, that's not them. If I call you and I begin, I've had this happen to me, so it's kind of funny, so I'll just use that example. If I call you and say, Gary, behold, the Lord has spoken thus night. It is of the divine's intention. And I start talking to you about a message the Lord has for you in King James or who knows what. You know what I do with most of those? <laughs> you say, why would you do that? Because the Holy Spirit has never spoken to me in King James. So whatever spirit speaking through you, you say, well, it could be just they're that religious. <laughs> if they're that religious, just saying. John chapter 14. Verse number 15, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. What does a counselor do? They counsel you. They talk to you. Exactly. And he won't be here just for our time on earth. He will be with us forever. The Spirit of truth, which we find out later in the chapter, is the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him but it neither see, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. In other words, I'm not going to abandon you, leave you alone. I will come to you. Well, how is he going to come again? Through the Holy Spirit, the counselor. Before long, the world will not see me anymore because he was in a physical body. He says, but you're going to see me. Well, how will they see him? They'll recognize his spirit. Oh, this is the spirit of God. You will see me because I live, you will also live. Verse 25, same chapter. All this I've spoken while I'm still with you because the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, go to the Holy Spirit. Well, I don't know what decision to make. Well, let him counsel you. That's what he's here for. And he will remind you of everything I've said to you. That is key. Because many times when the Holy Spirit talks to me, he's grabbing scripture and tying it in with. What's he doing? He's reminding me of what already was said in what he's saying now. Chapter 16, verse number 12. Jesus said, I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, he will not speak his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he's going to speak a future too. So he's going to show you. He's going to guide you. He's going to tell you a future, what's coming. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So he's going to find out what Jesus wants to tell us, take that and tell us, make it known to us. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and this is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So not only will he tell us things, he's going to reveal things of what is, what is rightfully ours. Folks, we are supposed to hear from God ourselves. That's, that's predominant. That's got to be first. You say, well, I'm really disappointed in the prophets because now I don't know what to believe. Well, you were believing wrong in the beginning. Now, I'm not condemning you. I'm just trying to point it out so you don't make the same mistake twice. Because I really believed what they said was God. Well, you believed wrong, and you were deceived. What did the Holy Spirit tell you? 
well, I didn't get anything. There is the problem. Don't blame the prophets. Blame yourself. You should have heard from God. Well, I don't know how. You need to start going after it, like everything else. I'll give you one more. Well, let me give you this one. Chapter 2 of Acts. We're at the end here, so let, let me just finish this. Chapter 2 of Acts, verse 17 and 18. In the last days, that's the time we're living in, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That's what we're after right now with the pouring out of the glory, pouring out of his spirit. That's where our messages are on. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on your servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. So prophesying is a language of the last days. It's mentioned twice there. The big key is the middle of verse 18. I will pour out my spirit in those days. The result of the pouring out is the prophesying. The core, the source of the information has to always be the Holy Spirit, especially in the last days. Now, that doesn't mean, well, see, he said he'd use prophets. Yeah, and they're human and they can miss it. So don't put them first. Get them in the right order and listen to them. Because if they're a true prophet of God, they will reveal things to you that God spoke to you about already, and they'll come along like Agabus did with Paul and fill in some of the details and paint the picture a little clearer, and you go, ah, oh, now I see it. That's a prophet of God. But if they're coming and announcing to you, like I, my first pastorate, this was big in, in, in the 80s. I don't know why this was big, but this was big in the 80s. Uh, my first pastorate, we had a, a visiting minister who came, well-known guy, big-name kind of guy, who came, pulled a young man, a teenager, I think he was 17 or 18, out of the congregation and declared over him that God has called him into the ministry and that whatever his plans are, forget them and start heading for ministry. And I'm going, oh, man. I knew this guy. I mean, he was in my youth group. So I didn't say anything. I let the whole thing go. And then I got a hold of his parents and him. And I said, we need to talk. And that week, I said, okay, so now this is how this works. Have you ever felt called to the ministry in your life at all? He said, no, I never. I the last thing I want to do. I asked the parents, did God ever tell you he is going to end up in the ministry? They kind of smirked like, no, they've told us some, God's told us some stuff about him, but never that he was going to end up in the ministry. I said, so here's what we do. We take everything that he said, and we kick it to the curb. Forget it all. If at some point the Holy Spirit speaks to you and calls you in the ministry, now you're good. In the meantime, forget that ever happened. It was a false prophecy. You know what their reaction was? You know what the kid said? Oh, thank God. <laughs> he said, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to do something I absolutely don't want to do. <laughs> and the parents kind of iterate, reiterated behind him like, oh, yeah, we were, that, that is such a relief. Because if he goes out into the ministry, he's going to really mess things up. <laughs> he wasn't called to it. But this was big back in that period of time where someone would come and pronounce your future to you because that's how they did it in the Old Testament. Well, guess what? We don't live there anymore. God needs to get a message to me. He'll talk to me. But there is an outpouring of the Spirit in the last days, and supernatural things do happen, so don't just throw it out. But let me end with this. I'll read the last verse of all seven churches Jesus spoke to in Revelation 2 and 3. And you don't have to follow me on the, on the computer on this because this will be quick. Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now this is speaking to the end time churches. Chapter 2, verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 2, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3, verse 6. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 13 of chapter 3. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And guess what it says in chapter 3, verse 22, to the Laodicean church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In the last days, we have to hear the Spirit. Amen. Period. Or it causes all kinds of problems and struggles. And confusion, like we just came through a time that a lot of Christians were very confused about because so many people said this election thing would turn out different than it did. And it didn't. And now what do we do so that we can still keep our faith intact? You shouldn't have put your faith in a man to begin with. You should have your faith in God. And the man missed it, so that won't mess with your faith at all because your faith's not there. Your faith's here. Once a man misses it and you are thrown in the ditch... You were wrong to be. Don't blame the man. I've had people come to me and say, and of course this years ago, back when some of the big name speakers, like, well, I'll name them. It'll be, for some of you, you won't remember them anyway. Um, Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart. Um, yeah, there was a number of them. Another guy from uh, uh, New Orleans, pastor in New Orleans. Don't remember him. Uh, I don't remember his name right offhand now, but uh, I will once I'm done speaking. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there was a number of them. And there was all kinds of Christians coming to me, and their faith was rocked to the core. I don't even know if I should serve God. Is this thing even real? Blah, blah, blah. Do you know what the problem was? You had your faith in Jim Baker, not in Jesus Christ. And the guy made a mistake, and the guy fell off the wagon. But guess what? Jesus didn't fall off the wagon. He's still where he was, and he's still good to go. You, well, I'm so angry with Jim Baker. I'm so angry with Jimmy Swaggart. I'm so fed up. No, no, no. Mirror, please. It's not their fault. You're struggling. You shouldn't have had the faith you were supposed to have in God in them. Your faith should have been in God, and they're just ministers, and they're just human. And they may fall off their pedestal one day. I hope I never do, but you know what? I could fall off my pedestal too. You say, why are you on a pedestal? Because that's where people put you. I don't want to be on a pedestal. But people, oh, Pastor Vern, that's a whole different subject. Let's not go there. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do that. Because if I mess up, now your faith's destroyed. Don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in Jesus. I'm just walking along following him like you are, trying to do what he asked me to do, and you do what you do. So we get upset with, well, they sinned, and it caused me to lose my faith. No, you were the problem. You shouldn't have had your faith there to begin with. But we all need to learn to hear the Spirit for ourselves. So I want to pray a general prayer, because there's, there's usually two or three things that keep us from hearing the Spirit. Number one is, we're not spending enough time with Him. So we don't recognize His voice. We don't hear Him. We, we just don't spend enough time with Him. Number two could be fear. We're a fearful kind of person. Fear does not help us hear God. And we need to deal with the fear before we'll ever really start hearing God. And number three is we're not at peace. You hear God's voice the clearest when you're totally at peace. When you're all wound up and emotional and uptight and worried and nervous. For me, that does not work. I, I don't hear God very well. It, it just kind of... He's speaking, and I'm probably hearing him, but... It's like, uh, it just gets mixed in with all those emotions. It doesn't work well. That's why he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, not going to leave you alone. And then in the chapter, he says, peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So do not be troubled. Do not be afraid. Why? Because the Holy Spirit operates in what the fruit of that kingdom is, which is peace. And if we're not hearing them, maybe because we're not in peace, we need to deal with that aspect of it. But, no matter what the source is, that's a whole different message. Not going to go there today. Here's what I want to do. We must, he who has ears, do you have ears? Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in the last days. It is God's will we hear the Spirit. I mean, he said it seven times exactly the same way. <laughs> it's like, you think? If it's not happening, it's not because he doesn't want it to happen. It's because there's something off on our end. 
we're going to ask him to reveal to us what's off on our end. And if you want in on that prayer, just stand and we'll just make it a group prayer. Jesus, we are so thankful you gave the Spirit to be with us, to be in us, to lead us, to guide us, to comfort us, to counsel us, to teach us, to show us the future, things to come, to, to just walk this thing out with us. We are so thankful for your Spirit, and we honor Him as one of the Trinity, as being one of the Godhead, a legitimate person that the Scripture speaks of. We honor Him as such, and we want to hear the voice of the Spirit. So, Lord, we're asking you. You're the Lord of the church. Holy Spirit, you're the one who speaks to us. So if Jesus wants to speak to us through you or he wants to, Jesus, if you want to speak to us directly, however you want to do this, we're just standing here and saying we see that we need to hear your voice. We need to hear the voice of the Spirit, especially in the last days, because deception is going to be so thick, like Jesus, you talked about in Matthew 24. Watch out. No one deceives you. Well, we just came through a whole bunch of deception, and we're still in a whole bunch. And the only one who is the spirit of truth, who will not deceive us but show us the truth, is the Holy Spirit. We must hear you for ourselves. So we are standing here saying whatever the blockage is, maybe some of us hear you pretty well, but it's probably not as good as we could. And then there might go all the way down to the point of some of us just, we, we just struggle to ever hear you. We are standing here saying, whatever that blockage is, reveal it to us so we can agree with you in breaking it and getting it out of our lives, getting it away from us so we can hear you and teach our children and our offspring, our lineage, who will face increasing deception in these last days. Teach them how to hear you. Lord, we can't give to them what we ever received. But what we freely receive, you said give. So we want to learn to hear you and give that on. That's why we're standing. It's what we're asking for. If two or three agree, it's touching anything, it will be done. Amen. So we're believing you're going to do it in every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.